All right. So we want to learn about the subtle science and exact art of Windows application performance monitoring, the alchemy of figuring out just what the hell Windows is doing when it's being slow. Well, we're not going to get any of that here, but what we will get is a basic primer on Windows performance monitor uh, and the things that I do when I'm trying to figure out why Windows is being inexplicably slow. So there's a number of tools that we can use to dive in a little bit as to what the system and the applications are doing. We're going to cover a few of those here. Um, there are many more, and some of them are probably even better than what I'll be showing here. Um, we're going to start with a tool called Perfmon, or Performance Monitor, which is built into Windows. When you load from the Start menu, this is what you get by default. And we're going to drill into the Performance Monitor piece of um, Monitoring Tools section. By default, we get a single metric plotted, which is a percent processor time across all processors. And right away, we can see that my computer is doing something. It's hovering around 30 and change percent CPU uh, averaged across all cores. Of course, the problem right now is that I, I'm doing a screencast. So, uh, and my resolution is like 3440 by 1440. So it's, it's a little bit chunky for encoding. Um, I don't think that's going to be a problem here, but we'll just have to be cognizant of the fact that there's a bit of a Heisenberg situation here where we're kind of interfering with the very thing we're trying to measure. Um, so I'm going to clear these counters by default and start a new add counters and windows you can see gives quite a number of metrics it instruments many corners of the os um, some of them are more useful than others we're going to start with processor which is actually the default that's highlighted and open up the section for processor and we can see all the various metrics under the processor section the one that i find most useful to start with is percent idle which um, is essentially 100% minus everything that the processor is doing. So we don't have to plot out, you know, kernel time, user time, uh, interrupt time, et cetera, individually. Uh, it's essentially all represented in one metric, idle time, which is flipped on its head because 100% means idle. So it just requires a slightly different way of thinking about it. So let's add those metrics, and then we'll go into uh, disk activity. Because for what we're doing, the most likely bottlenecks are, are either going to be CPU or disk. Could be networking, um, but probably you're not streaming samples off a network drive. Could be memory. But actually, um, the, the good thing about idle time is that time spent waiting on caches or, um, or RAM is actually included in idle time. So if your system has very slow memory and you're spending most of your time waiting on memory, that'll actually be reflected in idle time as well. So this is, as I say, it's a good starting point for uh, troubleshooting um, CPU issues or slowness. So physical disk is where we're going next. And we can see all the drive letters that I have as well as total. Um, so if we wanted to see what individual drives we're doing, we could select those individually, but I'm going to start with the total, which is a sum of all uh, disk activity across all the drives. Um, because I have my sample libraries spread across uh, all the drives. Um, and so it's more convenient to have a single line on the plot. So I'm going to measure uh, actually percent idle time for disk as well. We'll talk about that in a second. And disk bytes per second, I'm just holding the control key down here to select multiple metrics. Disk transfers a second, which is essentially IOPS. Let's add those in. So these are our metrics. Yeah, idle time is, um, on Linux, there's a, a metric that I use for, for uh, IO benchmarking all the time, which is basically average wait time in milliseconds. Uh, I, there's no such metric here, on at least on performance monitor. But the percent idle time is the next best thing. It's essentially the amount of time that Windows is not spent waiting for the disk, right? waiting for, for some IO operation to, to complete. So. Um, there's a, the average wait time, although it's not expressed in milliseconds, it's implicit in that metric. So let's add these. And now we've got our plot. So we can see all of the various cores. And uh, we can see that the, the uh, screencast that I'm doing, the video encoding is actually spread uh, relatively evenly across those cores, more or less. And we can see a lot of weird spikiness on the, the screen metric here. So we can just hover over the line and it tells us what it is. So this is disk bytes per second. And the reason that looks like that 
is the scale unit. So disk bytes per second is set to, what is that, one ten thousandth scale? So that means for every 10,000 bytes per second, it would show as one unit on the y-axis. So that means, what's that, 100 times 10,000, so a million bytes a second, so a megabyte per second would peg out the, the top of the y-axis, which is obviously not what we want. We're going to be measuring, you know, bytes per second in much higher magnitudes, probably closer to two, 300 megabytes a second. So we could adjust the scale of this by going to properties, select the scale, bump it up two or three, um, or down two or three more orders of magnitude. The most convenient way is actually just right click on it and then go to scale selected counters. And then Perfmon will just choose a scale that it thinks will fit the, the plot best. Um, we haven't actually generated much disk activity yet, so this probably still isn't suitable. It only dropped it down one order of magnitude. So once we start actually doing some disk I.O., we'll see uh, this will hit the roof again, but that's okay. We'll just rescale it at that point. All right, let's load up an instance of contact. And um, let's find a beefy-looking patch here. Uh, oh, you know what? The Friedlander's got a 24-bit version. Yeah. Um, all right, let's load in this patch. So I'm going to clear this plot. And let's load in the full 24-bit Friedlander and see what the graph is doing here. There's the two metrics going through the roof again. Actually, it looks like probably reads and disk bytes per second. So we're going to scale both of those. That's better. We'll wait for this to complete loading. Oh, why does it take so long? My computer has so much, <laughs> so much spare horsepower to use. And yet, we are sitting here watching this take ages and ages to load. Oh, we had a respectable blip here. We'll talk about that in a second. All right, so we're done. So pause the graph and let's take a look. Um, so the first thing to notice is this red plot at the top here, which is disk idle time, is showing, you know, mostly hovering around the 100% idle mark. And we get as low as 85% uh, idle, which means 15% 50 utilized, right, for disk activity. So we are almost certainly not bottlenecking on disk here. And if we actually look at some of these other metrics um, down, the, by the way, one benefit of plotting CPU idle is because it's from the top down and the disk metrics are from the top up, we actually don't, you know, they're neatly separated on the graph, which is also a, an added bonus. So disk metrics here show um, disk bytes per second around 185 megabytes. Um, which isn't bad. I know my SSD can do much more than that. So I'm not surprised that we're only 15% utilized or 85% idle on disk IO. And IOPS around the, the 2300 uh, mark, 2300 IOPS. These are, these are all read operations. So, you know, 2300 reads per second, which is respectable, but I know my SSD can do much more than that. All right, so the interesting stuff that's happening is going to be here. Um, so we're actually going to, since we've ruled out disk as a bottleneck, I'm just going to hide these counters. And let's just look at CPU. Um, I might as well keep disk IO, or idle time, because it's out of the way. So, okay, well, we, we talked about the, um, the video encoding, which is right here at the beginning of the plot. And then once we load the patch, we can see what looks to be a number of cores um, dropping in idle, or that is to say increasing in utilization. Um, and we see uh, various activity across all the cores, but interestingly, none of them are pegged. So we're not actually hitting, you know, more than, what's that even, 25% idle? Oh, Windows, why don't you tell me what it is? It does tell me, and I'll bet you if I hide all of these and just show one of them, it will tell me. So this one's as low as 20% idle. So, you know, there's still there's still 20% headroom here. And we're not actually using it. Let me show the rest of these. Sorry, the UI is a bit clumsy. And I'm also trying to walk and chew gum at the same time, so it's a little distracting. Okay, so the bottom line is, it, you know, it doesn't look like we are actually bottlenecking on CPU here if you look at this uh, single plot. 
with all the individual cores because no individual core is pegged. So you would wonder, well, what is it that contact is doing? What is happening on the system? Is this, you know, is it is it a memory issue? Well, no, it's not because again, waiting for memory will actually be reflected in CPU idle. Um, so we have to dive in a little bit deeper to figure out why this is apparently not bottlenecking on anything and yet is, you know, taking as long as it is. So one of the tools that I use is called Process Explorer. It's by SysInternals, very useful. Um, so these are all the processes running on my system right now. We can see the screen capture here is taking up. Again, this is out of 100 across all cores, so 20-ish percent of, of all available um, CPUs. And uh, Reaper's doing a little bit. Reaper is just running my mic processing right now, so a couple plugins for microphone stuff. But the one that we're looking for is Contact, so let's dive into that one. And the Threads tab is the most informative part. So we see here um, a couple active threads. Let's actually reload this patch and move this to the other monitor. Reload this patch and take a look at Process Explorer. So while it's loading, we can actually see there's only one thread doing anything, which means that this task of streaming these samples off disk and loading them into memory is single threaded. Um, and this is again out of 100, right? So it's 12 out of 100 on, and I have, it's four cores hyper-threaded, so I have eight logical cores to work with. 12% is not surprisingly one eighth. Um, but we didn't see that on um, Perfmon. We saw no individual core pegging. Well, what we know is happening here, well, well, we have a hypothesis, or at least I have a hypothesis as to what's happening here, which is that Windows is actually taking this single thread and just scheduling it across different cores. There's no affinity here of this thread to a core. Windows is free to schedule this thread across different cores, and we can see that it actually, or we think that it actually is doing that. Uh, yes, spoiler alert, I already know it's doing it. That's why I'm talking uh, with certainty. So. One way to confirm this is to use Process Explorer to peg contact or pin contact to only one CPU. Because this is a, th a single threaded task, we know that we're not actually gonna be hurting performance by doing that. So if I set affinity on the contact process, let's just peg it to CPU zero and rerun this test with perf Perfmon. So I'm gonna clear the chart, hit play, and load this patch again. Now, bear in mind that we won't actually be generating disk activity here because um, the samples are cached in memory, file system cache. So our uh, disk metrics should be near zero. And yeah, they're floating around origin. So, so we can see that, oh, of course it's yellow, right? It had to pick the hardest to read out of them all. Let's pick a different color for that one. So this is our processor zero and we can see it is flatlined. It is continuing to be flatlined and we should see it come back up when the patch is finished loading. And again, one thread in that process. It's now finished, processor zero has come back up. So we know that this is a, a, CPU, on a CPU bottleneck and we know that if I want this to be faster, I need to overclock my CPU, get a faster CPU. Getting more cores will not help. Single core performance is all that matters for loading this patch. And in general, loading um, contact patches because the process of, uh, of uncompressing the compressed samples on disk is CPU bound and it's single threaded. So single core performance is really all that matters for patch loading time in contact. Frustratingly, because there's no reason why this couldn't be parallelized. There's no reason why these samples couldn't be um, uh, uncompressed across multiple cores, and this would increase probably eightfold. Well, maybe not quite that, but certainly you know two or three times faster. And it's I don't know such an easy thing to do, inexplicable why they didn't do it. Um, and just so that you know, the engine is set to eight cores, so this is not a uh, an issue of the properties. It's just how it loads samples. All right. So you'll notice that when we were loading this patch, we actually didn't see any disk activity because as I said, the samples are gonna be stored in the file system cache after the first run. 
But if you want to benchmark multiple invocations or multiple um, iterations of a particular uh, experiment, like in this case, loading a patch, you can flush the file system cache using a another sysinternals tool called RAM map. Um, so this this tells you actually this this tool alone tells you a bunch of interesting things. But what we're more interested in is the standby um, column here, and this basically is telling me that I have almost 3.6 gig of uh, cached data. And I can clear that by under the empty menu, select empty standby list. I have to refresh it, and this should drop down to near zero. There it is. So we've purged file system cache, among other things. And if we rerun or reload this patch now, just to prove that this worked, we should start seeing uh, disk activity on our uh, physical disk metrics. So let's start the plot. Reload, and we see, yeah, we see a spike here on uh, disk IO. And we also see our CPU. But what's interesting here is that this isn't uh, pegged, which is interesting. So there's an interplay between, well, now it's starting to peg. But I was going to say there's an interplay between disk activity and um, processor time. But ultimately, this is, you know, we, we look at our disk idle, and we know that even though we're not using all the headroom available in CPU at this point, although we are now, um, we know that the the disk really wasn't the full bottleneck here, and throwing more uh, CPU at this problem would still speed up this case. All right, let's do another experiment um, with OmniSphere. Actually, you know what? I'm going to take the opportunity to show something else. So this has um, so far been sort of ad hoc. We've thrown in a couple of metrics to the performance monitor, but it's it's ad hoc. If we if we liked this um, set of metrics for doing performance analysis. You can save this uh, as a data collector set. So if you right-click on Performance Monitor, after having configured all the metrics, you set new data collector set, and it will basically create a new data collector set with these metrics in it. So I can call this CPU and I/O, and it's just asking me where to save it. And so now, under Data Collector Sets, User Defined, this this will show up as the metrics that we just created with the interval that we defined. Um, and that's useful if you want to record and, and preserve uh, the data collected across uh, different experiments. You can come back to it and, and it's all preserved. So, okay, let's load up Omnisphere. I've got a test project here with Omnisphere already loaded. And actually, I'm just going to go back to the live view. So what might be interesting is to load up a few multis and just browse different multis and see what is happening here within Omnisphere. So let's just clear it and fire through a couple of patches. We see a bit of disk activity, but generally our disk is again idle. We see CPU. Well, there's a couple spikes. So again, the question is, is this a single threaded process that's getting scheduled across different cores? Or um, is this neatly distributed across multiple cores? Well, again, process explorer to the rescue. Um, did I close it? Yes, I did. So this will Omnisphere will be um, in where is it Reaper host 64. It's loaded as a separate process. So this is actually just a separate process hosting Omnisphere. And we see what looks to be a couple active threads, but we don't know if those are, if there might be other threads involved in loading. So let's just do some loading. And here we can see a number of threads now that are actually using CPU time as I'm uh, clicking through these patches. So we actually know that in Omnisphere's case, unlike contact, the process of loading these patches is in fact multi-threaded and it's benefiting from more cores. So here's a case where both um, single-threaded performance but would help, but also uh, additional cores would help this, this process as well. And if we actually play one of these patches, well, that's not a very CPU-heavy patch.
this actually looks could very well be single threaded on uh, on playback. Um, I'd have to hunt around for a, a patch that's sufficiently uh, CPU demanding. I'm not seeing any signs of multi multi core uh, use here on on actually actual playback, but loading definitely was. So um, let's just load a couple more. Take a look at our plots. So no disk problems here. Again, it looks like possibly throwing more CPU might improve loading times, but we still have a fair bit of headroom actually. And if we're not, um, if, if loading in Omnisphere is spread across multiple cores and we're not bottlenecked on any single core, then there might be some other bottleneck here, which when I see, um, when I see a multi-threaded process that is not apparently pegging any single core and it's inexplicably slow, at that point, I start to blame the software itself. I, you know, I'd have to on Linux. I'd actually dig into it a little bit more and find out if there's um, lock contention and, and things like that that might be explaining it. On Windows, you know, I'm not a Windows developer, so I don't know what the hell I'm doing beyond that. I can only speculate what Omnisphere is doing here. So um, here we see a couple cases that are a little bit more subtle, but in in a lot of cases, the bottlenecks are much more obvious. So here we would look at the CPU plots, the disk plots. I mean, if we see any obvious signs of bottlenecking, then you know your, your work is pretty much done. If you don't, then you have to dive in a little bit more like we did to determine single-threaded versus uh, multi-threaded and draw some hypotheses from that. So I hope this was helpful as a, as a primer at least. And um, start here and we'll see what you see and uh, we'll take it from there. Good luck.